So Kwe Nedabok, Ndelawazi, Vera Longto Sheehan. Hello friends, my name is Vera Longto Sheehan and I'm the director of the Vermont Abenaki Artists Association and the founder of the Abenaki Arts and Education Center. In this virtual session, we welcome Jim Taylor of the Elnu Abenaki tribe in Southern Vermont, who is a talented graphic artist. He works in many traditional mediums and contemporary art forms including quill work, carving, and wampum. Jim, would you like to say a quick hello? Sure. Kwe kwe. Ndalawazi, Nanabi Wakwus, Alnobaki, Plowino. My name is uh, Jim Taylor. I'm Abenaki, Elnu, um, and Turtle Clan. Glad to see everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. And so if you'd like to start by say, telling the audience a little bit about yourself and, and also maybe Elnu. Okay, um, as Vera said, um, I'm a graphic artist. Uh, that's my full-time job. I design police badges, fire department badges, um, security, law enforcement. Um, not only um, domestically, but uh, globally, um, internationally. And um, so I've been doing that for 35 years this year. Um, so that's pretty much where, you know, uh, I was classically trained by my uh, maternal aunt, um, who was Abenaki. Um, she was the one that kind of coaxed the the um, the artist out of me, and um, so I owe everything that I have today to her and the creator. Um, I'm also a uh, tribal councilman for Elnu, and so my positions there is to uh, pretty much assist uh, our chief and to also work with our people um, and issues that affect us as a people. Um, so I do that. And um, I'm a quill worker, which is uh, one of my like passions. Um, I also dabble in everything else that is craft work, um, make toboggans, um, just finished a uh, doing our Eagle Staff uh, for El New. Um, it's, a, you know, a woodland style uh, ball stick, but it's has a, a traditional, um, I should say, you know, um, a non-traditional uh, web that we're going to introduce into the, uh, uh, the center instead of it being an actual uh, ball stick to catch balls. Um, so that that'll be completed very, very shortly. I just need to put eagle feathers on it. And, um, and I also um, have done uh, wampum beads for our uh, tribal constitution and also for the some of the beads that are at the state house uh, that are displayed at across from the Howard Dean painting. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's, you know, that's on the pipe. And um, so that's pretty much it. And I'm sure that, you know, throughout the conversation, uh, anybody ha has questions, you know, um, might spark another, another thing that I've been working on. Yes, of course. And I was going to start by sharing a picture of quill work in case some of our audience may not be familiar with that, just so they can get a visualization of what that looks like. So as we're looking at this bag, um, I think the first thing that comes up for me is to have you explain what quill work is, what kind of materials you're using, maybe why. This was a bag um, that I did for um, a, um, a Mohawk elder who is a seed keeper. Some of you may know him. His name is Stephen McCumber. Uh, 
he is uh, a uh, Mohawk member from Ganawage. And um, this was a bag that he asked me, um, well, essentially he told me I, he had a dream that I gave him a bag and and the dream I had was that I made him a bag that was set, not the one that he wanted, that he was asking that I had. So, um, so we discussed a couple of things. And, and um, so this is the bag that I did for him. And um, so with quill work, it's you're utilizing porcupine quills. Um, and I mean, that sounds easy, but um, on a porcupine, their average is about between 30 to 40,000 quills on one porcupine. There's five different size quills on a porcupine and each one has its own uses. Um, so if you get quills from somebody, the quills could be, you could get all five different size quills and to try to do a, say a bag like this using all five uh, size quills, it just would, it's going to be rather frustrating and um, it isn't going to look as good as you'd planned. So the quills are actually selected for, um, for the different types of, uh, or different bodies of uh, quill work here. If you look at the top of the bag on the flap, um, that is a, a traditional, um, and very well uh, used um, form of quill work, which is just basically a sawtooth pattern. It is one quill, two threads, and you're just sewing down a quill, folding it, stitching it down on the opposite side, folding it, and you just keep working back and forth till you start to run out of quill. And then you insert another quill under, um, it's, rather hard to like describe and visualize. Um, but it, you know, if you ever get a chance to see, and I am doing cool work and you watch how it's done, it's it's not as difficult as, as people may think. Um, so those quills on the top are selected for that, that space. If you notice that surrounding those boxes um, and what you're seeing in the center is an underwater panther. There's uh, like a single, like looks like drawings, lines, the, the um, uh, trying to, I'm having a, uh, a senior moment here. I'm trying to think the not their fins, but the, um, like the spikes on the back of the underwater panther. Um, those are just, you're using one quill and it's a very thin and long quill. So those are used for the line work that outlines the, the main body of quill work. Um, so, and this, and this bag here has a lot of sim symbology that uh, is synonymous with uh, Steve McCumber and who he is and what, you know, what he does as an elder and what he's doing for indigenous people throughout the world by um, seed keeping and seed saving. So at the very top are uh, what's traditionally seen in Shoni work, Mohawk uh, sky domes. And on top of each sky dome is a um, corn stalks because he's very much into saving uh, corn seed throughout the world. So, um, and those also, they're sky domes and they're also mounds that the corn grows in. And then the underwater panther, um, which is, a, everyone knows here in the northern tier of New England going out to the Great Lakes, um, that the underwater panthers reside in the lakes and um, that we offer them tobacco whenever we go out on the water so that they do not use their tails to create too many waves that could flip us over in our canoes. 
So um, with this particular uh, underwater panther, um, Steve McCumber is also in his community. Um, he is part of the False Face Society. Uh, they're a medicine society. And he, it, one of his jobs is um, making snapping turtle rattles. So what I did so that it, that part of him was included in this bag is I actually put the, the, the spikes or the fins that you normally see on, on the back of a snapping turtle going all the way down, just like on a snapping turtle's tail. Um, I actually put those and I included the black and green um, sawtooth to represent the snapping turtle itself. So, um, so that's pretty much the story on this bag. And the, the edging is done using um, glass uh, trade wampum that was um, heavily used during the French and Indian War. And it was, you know, traded throughout New England and the Great Lakes. I know you've been doing this a really long time. Can, can you um, tell us like how long you've been doing this and how you got started? I've been doing cool work for I'd say approximately 30 years now, which to me seems like, it's hard to believe that it's been 30 years. Um, I started doing quill work when I was heavily involved with our uh, tribe's living history um, component, which was known as the Woodland Confederacy. Um, we would travel around New England and we would be participating at various um, living history events. Um, and we would be portraying our ancestors that fought uh, in the particular battles at the particular places throughout um, Upper New England. And as a um, way of honoring our ancestors and also illustrating to the people that would come that they could actually see and listen to actual descendants of those ancestors that you know fought and died in those areas. Um, so I started doing cool work then be, or dabbling in it because the people that were doing it that mostly were not native, um, they just charged exorbitant prices for it. And I just basically said, I'm going to, I'm going to teach myself how to do this. And so with the help of Frank Speck's book, which was the only book at the time that was even out there for quill work, um, I was able to, you know, slowly start working at it and not getting so frustrated with it that I put it down and didn't do it anymore. I just kind of kept at it. And slowly it just got better and a little bit easier. And then a, a woman by the name of Jean Heinbuck, um, she took Frank Speck's book like 10 steps further and had very clear illustrations of exactly how quills were supposed to fold and, you know, with the particular stitches. And that helped out quite a bit. And, um, but also I sat with other quill workers that, um, you know, I was basically like an apprentice and just watched how they quilled because a lot of it for me is visual. I mean, even today, you know, there's different, there's a few techniques that I've, I haven't done. I think I have a good grasp of how it's done. And, but it's being able to sit down with the person so they could show me like, this is how, you know, the thread has to go this way in order for it to, you know, the quill to do this. And so, um, so my thing is, is when I tell people who want to learn how to do core work is just, just keep at it. Don't, don't get frustrated. And, um, you know, um, one of the things that 
I and a number of cool workers, both native and non-native, are trying to work on is to try to have like an actual um, get together where we all get together and basically share with one another like the various techniques that some of us have never done just to see how to do it. You know, I mean, there's some things that I like to learn, but it's not something I want to, it, I don't, it's not something that's really uh, synonymous with our style of quill work here in the East. Um, you know, there's, we're very different in our quill work styles between here in New England and as you go out west, their quill work is very different. Um, similar, but different. Um, most of the symbol, you know, symbiology is is different, um, and the patterns are different than what we do. Plus, we do a lot of our stuff on walnut dyed uh, brain tan, so it looks the the bags look like a chocolate brown or once you oil them, they actually turn to almost a black, which was very, very unique to the Great Lakes and the New England tribes. When you think about historic quill work and your own quill work that you're creating today, how would you say it's different or the same? Um, all right, I'm gonna share my screen. I have, I have something that could, what you're seeing here is um, a number of, of actual historical pieces, um, roughly all from about, I'd say 17, 1740s to uh, 1820. Um, when, I, when I look at, you know, the historical um, pieces, um, especially this, this moccasin here, um, there, the the moccasin on the left that's on the black box. I, I don't know if you guys can see my my cursor. So this moccasin here on the left, um, you can see it's 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 dyed black. You know, a lot of it is worn away. I I just love this moccasin because it is so simple that just that one single band of cool work going down the seam with just some simple line work and very basic. The, the, the cuffs aren't decorated, which is, you know, these mo this moccasin was probably, you know, most moccasins were not decorated with quill work. They were, you know, they, whenever they would be going on campaign, the um, many of the warriors actually had like five pairs of moccasins that they carried with them just to get them from point A to point B. And then some accounts we have is that they actually stopped to kill a number of deer so that they could make moccasins to, for the return trip. So at some point, someone just did some basic quill work. They had a little bit of free time and they did some a basic bit of quill work on that moccasin. And it just, it has a lot of power to me. Um, and then now you look down here and you see these, um, these are a pair of moccasins that are Seneca. Uh, very, very, very ornate. Um, these moccasins were made, um, probably about, I'd say early 1800s. And they were actually part of the tourism trade in the Great Lakes and up near um, Niagara Falls. Women would make these moccasins. The ones, uh, the women were in the, um, the Ursuline uh, convents and the nuns had taught them how to do different types of embroidery. And so the, the indigenous women that were there then took some of those patterns and translated it into the, uh, you know, the cool work you see. And these were called slippers. 
and they would sell them as part of uh, like a tourism trade in uh, at Niagara Falls uh, because it it was a you know it was a um, wonder of the world so to speak and people from New York City Boston would travel there to see it and so the indigenous people there in the Great Lakes much like uh, our you know Abenaki uh, ancestors who um, and family and relatives who were selling baskets. Um, that was a big place to sell baskets as well. So this was a, th these are a beautiful pair of moccasins. Um, this bag here, the one that's orange, white, and black, that's at a museum in Germany that um, one of my close friends was actually, uh, she was there interning and she contacted me and said, I found a whole bunch of cool work. Do you want me to take some pictures? And I was like, oh, heck yeah. So some of these bags have not seen the light of day. And um, they're in a collection there in drawers. Um, she sent me a number of pictures. And this was one of the one of the nicest ones that, you know, uh, they had that was in uh, very good shape um, for its age. Um, this bag here. Uh, with the green, I call it the Christmas bag. It, um, this has a lot of symbology on it. These designs represent the upper world, the lower world. Um, Thunderbirds dwell in the upper world. Um, you notice the sturgeon, that's what the, these represent. Um, they live in the lower world. Um, this bag here is currently in the Peabody. Um, I had I had the opportunity to actually go and um, like handle this bag. Um, it was really amazing. Um, and the same thing goes for this neck knife sheath. That's in that is also in the Peabody. That was another a very synonymous uh, Eastern uh, accoutrement. You don't see. Uh, Plains people wearing neck knives. Um, that was something that was exclusive to us here in the East and the Great Lakes. And then this was a lot uh, very, this is very much Great Lakes, Anishinaabe, Odawa uh, people. These are, they are what would commonly were worn was what we call split belly pouches where there's a you use a full animal skin and this there is a slit just below the the chin of the the animal where you could insert your hand and basically you would have um you'd carry things and then you would take the, the head of the animal pass it under your sash and over your sash and this way here it would you know uh, it would stay on your belt and uh, you could carry various items. Well, those, those then kind of transitioned from using actual animal skins with the fur on and they transitioned towards making these style bags, which were representative of those old bags. So these came much later. Um, same thing here, there's a lot of symbology. The um, thunder, Thunderbirds on the top, the sturgeons. Um, even out on the Great Lakes, sturgeons were, um, uh, were in the Great Lakes. And I mean, extremely large until they were hunted till almost extinction. Um, I think the largest one that they had recorded where I actually saw a very old tinnitite photograph of it was 26 feet long. So um, they had hauled it up onto a, onto a, uh, the lake edge and uh, kind of sad to know something that big was there and is no longer there. At least we think they're no longer there. But um, I also do believe that um, that the sturgeons did play a part in the the underwater panther um, 
belief that, you know, people would say that they could, they knew the underwater panther was under their canoe because they saw its tail and it, and it, it, um, you know, it stirred up the water and with sturgeons, they like to bask just below the surface to when it's, when the sun is out and, um, and they're almost like, you know, asleep. And when they're startled, they immediately swim away. So, plus they also have the, the fins on their back um, that look similar to what is believed to be on the back of the underwater panther. So from a historical sense, I, it's very, for me, it's, it's really amazing to be able to see some of these old pieces that still exist and to be and be lucky enough to go to some of the museums where they're housed. There's a number of uh, old work um, in England um, because during the French and Indian War and dur during the 1820s um, in Canada with the British, they would, um, a lot of the uh, military uh, lieutenants, whatnot, they were they would collect these items from the Indians. They would like trade for them, and then they were sending them home to put into curio cabinets. And um, a number of of officers, one in particular that was stationed in Michilimackinac, he uh, Jeffrey Amherst, he ended up sending back a massive amount of items to the British Museum. And well, I'm sorry, not to the British Museum, but home. And he had like quite a large collection, which was then later donated to the British Museum. And, and his entire collection is makes up a huge amount of their collection. Um, so there's a book called um, Patterns of Power and in that book, it's almost exclusively all of his collection and everything from uh, sashes, wampum, uh, quill work, um, various uh, musical instruments, um, even instruments, uh, moose bone. Um, they weren't brushes, they were bones that they carved out of the antler to paint various designs. Um, really amazing stuff. I mean, uh, you know, plus some watercolors that uh, were done for him of the various native peoples that he was in contact with there. And that also went back as well. So that's for historical purposes. I think the originals are the, the inspiration for me. Well, you've certainly done a lot of research over the years. Um, I've known you, I think, most of those three decades you've been doing quill work, and I've always known you to be researching and learning constantly and talking to folks who are very knowledgeable. And you've talked about how um, you and other quill workers sort of um, teach each other and try to um, like you're reviving this art form. So what does that mean to you to be able to do this? It's, it's a, it's, I want to, I don't, I don't know if the word heavy, like it weighs heavy on you. It weighs heavy in a good way. Um, the creator bestows gifts upon all of us. We all, we all have gifts that the creator has given to us. And it's our job as, as indigenous people to share that gift, not um, jealous, like jealously um, hoard it, where we don't, you know, we won't share with other people because we're fearful that they're going to take what we know and, um, and make money off of it. And, and, and in this day and age, there is that level of anxiety that, you know, you, you're a little guarded with 
who you want to share it with. But aside from that, I mean, I'm willing to share anything. I mean, um, and if someone, and I, I, I have a number of close younger people that I helped who have become amazing glow workers and have gone on to like do some amazing pieces that I like, I'm just blown away by. And, but for me that they honor me by, you know, doing what they're doing now. So, you know, I feel good about that. Um, it's, I have one piece that's, um, part of the uh, American Museum of Natural History in New York. And it's, for me, that that's something that my future grandchildren will see. So, you know, that's an emotional thing. I mean, you know, you, we all want to leave something behind and that's my legacy. Not my legacy, but my legacy to my people and to my, my, the next seven generations. That's, that's, you know, when I say that, that's what I'm saying is it's my legacy to them, uh, my gift to them. And so, you know, it's my hope that, you know, that the, that the, the cool work you know, isn't going to go away. It's not going to, you know, hopefully not, you know, die out. Um, I'm, I'm trying to make sure every day that's not going to be the case with being able to share with other people. You just answered two or three different questions at the same time. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so you did talk about that legacy aspect in being able to leave your artwork um, for the next seven generations, that idea that your grandchildren or great-great-grandchildren will be able to touch this piece at some point in time. And I happen to know the piece that's at the American Museum of Natural History. I've seen it. And um, when you did that and when you do other artwork, do you do replicas of pieces or do you do something different? That's that's really good um, question, and uh, I was actually thinking about that earlier. Um, a lot of times, people will ask me to reproduce a piece. Um, you know, if they're if they're doing living history and they they want something like that, um, I won't reproduce the design and the colors um, as the original. I'll, I change things, um, you know, because reprodu that piece that was made, even though it, it, it exists in a picture or it exists in, an, in a museum somewhere, that piece still has the power that was imbued into that uh, item when it was being done. So whoever did that for whoever, that was, you know, that bag was either, uh, you know, um, symbolized a, you know, uh, a vision of some sort or, you know, something, you know, uh, a dream. And so I do not wanna, you know, as a, an indigenous person copy something. So, I will change the design. I will change the colors. Um, I will um, put things in there that are um, that pertain to the person. Um, there's kind of like a little little bit of an interview process, um, you know, when I do things for some people. And a lot of times, people will ask me, you know, like, you know, well just do, you know, just create something and, you know, from scratch. And, you know, that, that in itself is, you know, um, is a way of creating a, an original piece 
that is for that person that is ha that has their power um, through whatever designs that they may have asked me they want that they want or I may in a case like Steve McCumber's bag all he wanted was the underwater panther but he didn't say I want these colors or I want it to look like this and he left that up to me and knowing the things I know about him and what he's involved in that's where I put those things into it so like when he received the bag and he saw what was there he immediately like knew that all the things that we talked about all the things he's involved in is in that bag and so for him he you know uh he feels that power and um so yeah, I don't, I don't like to, um, you know, I don't copy anything. I, I may reproduce some, you know, a style of a bag that's similar, but I will change things so that it, it's synonymous, um, you know, to that, um, that person or, you know, the plate, you know, the commission. And we have a question from the audience. Uh, Tina is asking, do you only do quill work on leather or do you also do it on birch bark? You know, that is something that is one of the things I have never done. Um, I, I marvel at uh, some of the, the birch bark containers that I've seen done with uh, the quill work uh, with the quills and um, one day I'd like to attempt it, but I just have so much on my plate time-wise that, you know, I haven't done it. And, um, but yeah, no, that, I, I, I think it's, it's just as beautiful on quill work as it is on leather. And it's its own art form, you know. Um, it plus, for me, you know, I currently live in Rhode Island, so birch trees and not, they're not easy to come by. And, um, you know, so when I do go up north and I'm able to, we try, you know, during the two times a year that we can collect bark, um, I try to grab some, but I usually use it for, you know, bark containers and stuff. But one of these days I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna sit down and just play with it. But, um, you know, that was a good question. Yeah, um, and that leads me to kind of wondering, um, I'm kind of wondering about what other projects you might have or want to do you haven't had a chance to do yet. Um, I'm trying to think there's, one of the, one of the, I mean, one of the cool work projects that for myself that I've wanted to do um is what's called a, a slat sheath um neck knife and um i don't have any I, I don't have any images of one to show you but i had probably i mean i do but i'd be showing you somebody else's work um but yeah it's it it was traditionally um a neck knife and it had two wood slats and then these slats were quilled and they had um, a very unique, um, I'd say like basket pattern. Hold on a second, I can actually describe this even better. So this is, this is what I'm describing is this pattern. This is, this is a piece of ash, like basket slat. And this is, quill wrapped over the wood. And then if you, I guess those quills right there are woven underneath, like they start over back in here. And then as you fold these quills, you create that pattern. And so on the quilled slat sheets, it's basically the same concept, except they run vertically instead of horizontally and they're side by they're side by side 
that's one project that I'd like to I'd like to do. It's it's one of those projects that, like I said, um, I can quill wrap the ash slats no problem. It's then stitching those down onto the onto the sheet. There's a particular technique using these running threads that I have never attempted. And um, that's one of the, one of my projects I'd like to do at some point. Um, I finished a piece recently, which um, was an emotional piece to, um, to do. Um, we had an elder. So this is a, um, uh, a neck knife sheath that I did for a very close um, friend of ours, um, an ally, uh, you know, with our community. Um, his name is DDA. He lives in Vermont. Um, he's he's a brother to me, and um, so he wanted me to make him a neck knife, and. This was, you know, just before COVID hit and I had been kind of dragging my feet on it because I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And so um, what had happened earlier, um, we, uh, I, we have a tribe member that lives in Pepperell, Mass. Um, and they live on a farm. And every, every year, just after Thanksgiving, uh, Thanksgiving weekend, you know, after the holiday, a uh, number of our um, tribe members would go there and we would go um, and deer hunt. So um, the, uh, it was uh, Rose and Dave Hartwell and Rose was also an amazing quill worker. And what happened was before COVID hit, during the summer, she suffered a brain aneurysm and is now unable to speak or walk. And she's in an assisted live in a, in a rehabilitation uh, home uh, miraculously has been unaffected by COVID thank God in mass and so her husband asked me because she was not going to be able to do quill work again or do any craft work she had a room that was basically her craft room and my job as the tribal elder was to go through her stuff. So I was, you know, going through her belongings and wasn't easy. And um, so I discovered like she still had brain tan left and she still had like a really amazing assortment of quills that she had was much, much better at organizing than I was. And um, she had them all separated in little containers all by the various sizes. So it make her, her projects easy to, easy to put together. And um, so I, I found the brain tan and I COVID hit and I just, I was, now working from home and work was really slow. So while I was sitting at my, my laptop waiting for emails for jobs to do, I, uh, I was quit working. So I was able to, you know, produce this piece for, for DDA. And um, so I used her brain tan which was this one here is just, it was a beautiful dark smoked, you know, uh, hide, super, super soft. And 
I just started, just started doing the cool work. And, you know, I always had the Thunderbird um, pattern in my head, but the, the rest of the pattern just kind of came together. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to include the four colors of man in the, um, in the handle. This is a, this is a very unique uh, form of cool work, which is not exclusive to, to the Northeast. This here is plating. Um, this was also very big out West. Um, a lot of the uh, Calumet pipes were wrapped with plating. Um, those still exist too. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I did this sheath for him and this was, this was uh, essentially Rose's last piece. So, <clears throat> You know, her spirit like came through me or guided me to create this for him. And she loved DDA and he loved her. And um, so that was that was my gift to him. And you know, so this is like I said, this is like one of the last pieces that I've done as of late. And um, it's probably one of the most, for me, you know, one of the most, I, I mean, I've done a lot of cool work and done some, you know, people have told me, you know, some beautiful pieces, but this is one of the ones that I just really concentrated on making sure that all the quills were the right size because after going through her stuff and seeing how organized she was, it just kind of inspired me to, to do the best job I could. And um, so I know if she was able to comment on it, she would, she'd be happy with what the end product looked like. So, so yeah, this is, um, it's good you know, glass pony beads, the trade wampum. Uh, those are um, tin cones with uh, dyed deer tail hair in them. Uh, I use uh, natural dyes. I've used them and only on a, like a handful of pieces. The uh, the issue with me for is is being able to collect natural dot like collect the the plants and things um the, they just i there's a lot of plants that i just can't get a hold of here and so um so i use exclusively mostly writ dye um i use black walnuts for my um to dye my brain tan with so that you know um that's a traditional uh dye um, and, and that's the only dye I know that can, it will, it will retain its, its strength, even, you know, after you've used it a, a few times and it doesn't have a short, like short, uh, shelf life, you know, to, to use over and over. So this is, uh, this is the first time I've been able to talk about this piece without, without getting very emotional. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's a beautiful piece, you know, I just, and he loved it. I mean, he actually cried when I gave it to him. I mean, we both did, but so, so that, that's pretty much it there. Oh, oh Jim, thank you for sharing that. And, um, for talking about Rose and the loving way you do, we all, um, we all miss her, her smiling face and watching her, you know, every, I think every memory I have of her involves her doing quill work. Yeah. Well, either when she was done with what she was doing or she starts by doing quill work and everybody starts to come and then she puts it down. Yeah. Um, 
so so thank you for that. Um, we do have some questions for the audience and I have more questions for you, but I need to um, say something to the audience before we continue because um, some people have started to sign out. Um, I have put a link in um, the chat box. Before you leave, if you could fill out the sur exit survey for us and let us know how you liked today's program. And that will be very helpful for us um, to be able to find funding to continue doing virtual programming and things into the future. Um, in any case, with that being said, um, the, we have another question from Tina. Do you collect your own quills or use an old blanket? I, um, most of the, um, almost exclusively all the quills that I get are through um, roadkill porcupines. And um, so uh, we'll, we'll, what I normally do is I just um, skin the porcupine, um, salt the hide, you know, and I store it in a, in a like a uh, airtight container with some off balls or whatever to keep any, any bugs that might be on it off. But um, yeah, and then what I do um, is I'll select areas on the hide um, dependent upon the, the item that I'm going to make, whether if it's a bag, I'll, I'll select a certain area that has the, the number of quills and the size of the quill that I'd like to use. Um, so then I just cut that out. I, you know, I, I put it into a bath with a little bit of, um, uh, like dishwashing liquid, which then takes some of the, the grease, the grease and oils off the quill, which allows it to be dyed easier. Um, cause sometimes if there's too much of the oil, um, in the quill, it won't take the dye, um, but you don't want to take out too much of the oil because then you could end up with brittle quills um, that dry out. And then you'll stitch this beautiful piece down and then you'll go to burnish the quills down to flatten them and then all of a sudden they break. And I did have that happen on a piece for a guy in Australia and I had to do the whole thing over again. And so I learned my lesson real quick. Um, yeah, so most of my quills are through road kills. Um, I mean, some of the, I mean, you know, some of the porcupines are, um, you know, if they're too small, you know, they're very young. Um, I don't, you know, I just place them into the tree line and, you know, uh, I mean, I offer tobacco to all of them, but, you know, I just put them on his journey. And, um, but I have to say that Maine has some of the biggest porcupines I've ever found. And, um, you know, it's a running joke that um, I was, I was driving back from a Confederacy meeting on Campobello Island and uh, uh, Chief Roger and his son who were following me and I had told them exclusively, if you see my brake lights come on and I jack over to the right-hand side of the road, just pull up ahead of me. Don't worry, I'll catch up with you. And um, I'm jumping out. And I actually had a, I actually brought a Rubbermaid container with me with a lid just to be able to put dead porcupines in on the, on the ride up or the ride home. And so on the ride home, I ended up getting two nice porcupines and Roger said, that's it, no more. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so uh, mostly roadkill, you know. That's fantastic. Um, I love those stories. So many of us have stopped for roadkill along <laughs> the way for our artwork. Um, my daughter went to school when she was like in second grade and they were like, what did you do over the weekend? We went looking for roadkill. <laughs> <laughs> Had to explain that one. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, so um, 
You sent some images, um, which you've gone through a few of them, but I thought there there was one that I thought everybody would think that was really interesting that you might mm -hmm. want to talk a little bit about. It's the headdress, the crown type headdress. Can you talk to us a little bit about this headdress and how it might be different from the other headdress you showed us before? Um, you showed us the headdress with the quill work with the fawn skin. Yeah. How, maybe how they're different, why they're different. Okay. This is, this is a, um, a headdress that was, um, people, you know, early on every, they, you know, through Hollywood and whatnot, um, you know, Indians all had war bonnets on and stuff like that. But, you know, being uh, involved in living history and reading like, like vast amounts of uh, documentation uh, of encounters um, that the French and various, um, I don't wanna say explorers, but um, people like Champlain, um, uh, I'm trying to think of uh, Peter Kahn, uh, he was a gentleman who came and um, he spent a lot of time with, um, you know, the Hurons and a lot of the uh, Eastern peoples, uh, Abenakis, um, you know, not so much, you know, Haudenosaunee people because they just didn't have an open door policy. Um, the, um, so he, he wrote down quite a bit of stuff and it, it's really a wealth of knowledge. Um, and it gives you a really gl uh, like good glimpse at things. And these were called crowns is what they would, um, they would refer to that the Indians would show up wearing crowns of feathers and various, uh, you know, uh, you know, hair and, you know, the way it was designed. And there's some old, there's some um, very old, um, early on, like 1500s, 1600s, um, uh, engraving of Indians wearing what looks like this particular style headdress. Um, and they look like a crown. And, you know, some of the early depictions when you see the, like the Indians wearing the feathers, they, the artist of the day did take some liberties um, and instead of, he saw feathers, but what his, what his illustration was, was of feathers that people back in England would recognize as feathers. And so it wasn't like, oh, well, we can, you know, I'm going to draw this and I'm going to draw what looks like eagle feathers. Well, the people back in England or Europe, you know, Spain, wherever it was, they wouldn't understand that. So, but what was very, um, you know, very popular over there was ostrich feathers. So some of these crowns you see are look like they're decorated with ostrich feathers. But we as indigenous people knew that we didn't have any access to ostrich feathers. And as, as an actual artist who's gone through, you know, art school and, you know, art history and, um, and like having to take world history that coincides with your art history you realize that, and you see in a lot of these paintings, you you know, that artists were taking liberties, but they were doing it so that they could better illustrate what it was that they saw, but could be understood for the viewing public, um, and be better received. So this is con this is called a you know would be called a crown, and this is um, we have the um, the walnut dyed brain tanned um, hide. And it's just decorated with the black and white porcupine quills. And then these were, um, it was a yellow with, I believe there was some green, um, which is double curves. Um, this was a, this was a piece that I did for uh, 
that's displayed at the Burlington Airport currently, um, you know, on behalf of, you know, all of the uh, um, other Abenaki artists that submitted things. And this also has um, green parrot feathers. And what a lot of people don't, um, may not know is back in the uh, 700s, there was what they called the Carolina, Carolina parakeet. And it wasn't a parakeet like we see in the pet shops. It's like, you know, only about six to eight inches, you know, tall. Um, these birds were rather large and that they were not only just, you know, from the Carolinas, but they went all the way up into New England. And there's an actual account of complain that the number of Abenakis chasing a Carolina parakeet here in New England and trying to get it so that he could, you know, send it back to France or whatever. So um, they could, you know, you know, marvel at it. But the Indians knew what it was. And so there is one headdress that is, um, it's over, it's in a German museum. I can't think of the name of it. Um, that is an Abenaki, it is attributed to the Abenaki. And on that headdress, it has both um, what looks like uh, immature bald eagle feathers and Carolina parakeet feathers in the front, just as, just as this, uh, particular one is. And what is in front of the parrot feathers is moose hair, dyed moose hair. And that was something that was part of where it gave that look of like a crown. Um, so I did this and there's some uh, wampum beads on the, um, the little rosette drops that are on either side of the, uh, the headdress. Um, you know, the double curves uh, there, the upper world um, pattern uh, with the black diamonds and the, the white. And um, I kind of, I kind of went a little crazy with the, the, the mannequin and um, scared the daylights out of my wife. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I left it on the table, just the mannequin head. And uh, after I painted it, <laughs> So, um, but, you know, it, it really, um, you know, brings out like how it was worn and, you know, a better glimpse at, you know, what someone like Champlain or Peter Kahn would, you know, see if they had, uh, when they first encountered, you know, our ancestors. You brought up some very interesting points, which I think many people in our community bring up often. The idea that we know things about our culture that aren't written anyplace else, that weren't written in firsthand accounts. There are things that are passed down through oral tradition, generation to generation. Um, I don't know if you want to elaborate that on that at all, or um, just let that sit? Yeah, I don't think, think about that. Now, when you say, are you saying in respect to like, like oral traditions um, in what res like to quill work or? I'm, I'm... Well, it can be in relation to quill work, um, but just commenting back on the idea that you, you how you were saying, um you know that you know how we know we have these we had these birds at one time oh i see yeah yeah and things so um sometimes it's in relation to the art we do sometimes it's in relation to other aspects of culture um but sometimes the dominant culture doesn't know how much we know about our own history and yeah i mean that that is that you know, that is, uh, you know, a big, um, it's kind of an issue, you know, I've had discussions with other like New England Indians 
especially like, you know, living in Rhode Island, I, you know, I'm a guest of the, the Narragansetts and the Wampanoags here. And, um, you know, and I, I hold my that way, you know, when I, when I'm with them. Um, but there's a, it's interesting that a number of them also, you know, even though some of these things were written, you know, there's accounts, um, they, they immediately will disregard some of the things that are, they, they cherry pick what they want to use in their culture as to what they like. And whereas I think as Abenaki people, we've taken some of the, like we, you know, you read those accounts and then you can, then you interpret them and, um, and understand them better from an indigenous perspective. Um, so, you know, yes, it was, you know, it was written by a non-native person, but some of those non-native people were not doing it. They weren't jotting down what they were writing maliciously. They were actually recording it at, like as they were understanding it or as they, you know, as they heard, like they, they saw it. Um, so I think that they, it's, you know, it, it's somewhat difficult from time to time, like, you know, trying to explain to someone, well, this is, you know, about the Carolina parakeet. And I mean, I've had people, you know, uh, you know, people here, friends of mine, just like, like, how do you even know that? And it's, well, if it wasn't for Champlain jotting down like that he was chasing around a Carolina parakeet in, you know, in New England, it would just go right under the radar. But for us, you know, as an indigenous person, it just reaffirms what we know that they were here and we all know that they're extinct now um, yeah, I mean, just like passenger pigeons, I mean, uh, you know, some of the, the, the stories that I've read about just how they would blacken the, the, literally blacken the sky where they could blot out the sun, you know, the flocks were so large. And then just to think today, they're all gone. Um, so same goes for the parakeet. Well, Jim, I think you did a fantastic job. Because you've answered everybody's questions. And you're getting thank yous from the audience, Blue and A, Jim. From and so there is there are more thank yous coming in. And while the thank yous are rolling in, I would like to say Blue and A to Jim and to the audience for joining us 